from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, my name is Mary Lou Reeker, and on behalf of the Library of Congress's Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center, I want to welcome you to a talk by Dr. James, Richard James Bell, entitled Liberty or Death, Slaves, Suicides, and the Fight to Destroy American Slavery. Now make sure your phones are off, folks, okay, in case. We don't want any strange buzzings in the middle of the lecture. Uh, Dr. Richard Bell graduated summa cum laude in history from Cambridge University and went on to earn his PhD in American history from Harvard University, where his dissertation examined the cultural significance of suicide in the early years of the American Republic. Currently, Dr. Bell is an assistant professor of history at the University of Maryland in College Park where he has won a number of awards for his teaching, his mo the most recent being the university's Undergraduate Teaching Excellence Award. Although I have to tell you that when I saw the list of awards that he's won for teaching, the one that really grabbed me was the one from the students themselves called Amazing Teacher Award. <laughs> Apart from his work in the classroom, he has published widely, contributing chapters to books, articles to both reference works and to journals, the latter include the Journal of the Early American Republic, Early American Literature, and Slavery and Abolition. His book, We Shall Be No More, Suicide and Self-Government in the Newly United States, will be available this coming fall through Harvard University Press. We are particularly pleased to mention this since Richard applied for the Kluge Fellowship precisely to complete the last chapter of that book. So I'm glad it was a success, Richard. Today, I want you to welcome him roundly. He's got a lot to tell us about the way abolitionists looked at, examined, and publicized uh, the call for abolition around the issue of suicide and self-destruction. First of all, thank you, Mary Lou, for that introduction. I thank you for everything that you and Carolyn Brown and the whole staff of the John W. Kluge Center have done for me this past um, year. I've been in here in, uh, off and on for the last uh, almost 12 months now, and it's been an extremely productive uh, time for me. And this talk, in part, comes out of the work I've been able to do uh, at the Kluge Center and through the Library of Congress uh, collections, which are astonishing, as any of you who work here uh, already know. Uh, I have a lot to cover, a lot of ground to cover today, so I am actually going to dive uh, right in. Uh, and this um, presentation is a version of a chapter of this uh, forthcoming book, uh, We Shall Be No More, Suicide and Self-Government in the Newly United States. Uh, and it's also a version of an article forthcoming in a journal called Slavery and Abolition. Okay, um, let's see if this tech works. It does. Good. Uh, pinning his master to the ground, Quashy sat astride his chest and drew a blade from his belt. His master had chased him across this stone-strewn field, trying to whip him for a, qu a crime Quashy knew he had not committed. When Quashy had tripped and fallen, they had struggled for what seemed like hours until at last the stout black overseer got the better of his white owner. Quashy pulled the blade. But his owner was not its target. Instead, Quashy plunged its cutting edge into his own flesh, tearing a wide gash across his throat with all his strength bathing his master in his blood. Now, although all this took place on the sugar plantation on St. Kitts, a Caribbean island, uh, you wouldn't have known it from reading about it in, in the American press. When the story started turning up in anti-slavery pamphlets from Massachusetts to Pennsylvania in the late 1780s, editors trumpeted its authenticity while simultaneously stripping away all traces of its Caribbean island setting and turning it instead into a plausibly continental American illustration of plantation violence here at home. Alongside the bare facts of the event, 
each retelling glossed the story with a layer of testimony to Quashie's lifelong dignity and unimpeachable sense of honour. The effect was to frame Quashie's dramatic suicide astride his tormentor as a stern rebuke to the liberal Republican idea that African slaves lacked the natural virtue to stand firm against tyranny. Such greatness of mind, mourned a writer for, for Philadelphia's independent gazetteer newspaper in a fairly typical eulogy. Now today I want to talk about why anti-slavery activists told stories like Quashie's over and over and over. And my goal by doing so is to spotlight a debate about power and consent that I think lay at the heart of the anti-slavery movement's struggle to confront the peculiar institution. Should slaves use every means at their disposal, no matter how violent and no matter how costly, to defy their enslavement and seize their liberty? Or should they endure their subjection and wait patiently to be emancipated? Was a slave's suicide then an act of principled resistance worthy of admiration and encouragement, or a measure of abject victimhood that demanded humanitarian intervention? Between the Revolution and the Civil War, an ever-growing and increasingly coordinated group of anti-slavery activists seized upon the figures of black men and women dead by their own hands as they took positions on this fundamental question, the question as to who ultimately has the power to kill slavery dead. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to forego an analysis of colonial anti-slavery and the origins of organized activism in the revolutionary era and begin instead just after that in the late 1780s on the fringes of these first organized associations, where a decidedly uncoordinated group of white ministers, poets, and ex-slavers can be found trying to saturate the public prints with accounts of slavery designed to elicit outrage and action among ordinary readers. Borrowing inspiration from English sources, activist authors, including Hartford lawyer Zephaniah Swift, New Haven preacher Jonathan Edwards, not the Jonathan Edwards, and Rhode Island provocateur William Patton, took the horrors of the Middle Passage as their theme, quickly turning the theme of saltwater suicide into a major motif. While some of these activists preferred to talk in the aggregate of the thousands of slaves whose self-inflicted deaths bore witness to the slave trade's unprovoked inhumanity, most stories, uh, excuse me, most of these activists found stories of individual suffering uh, and suicide to be more powerful. Whether intended to stir public support for the federal abolition of the slave trade or for gradualist schemes to exterminate racial bondage in northern states like New York, a great many depictions of slaves dead by their own hands uh, in this revolutionary era, the 1780s and 90s, tended to strike the same notes over and over again. Between the first American appearance of a British poem called The Dying Negro in 1774 and the ban on further imports of African slaves signed into federal law in March 1807, Poets and prose writers offered up myriad portrayals of slave suicide that repeatedly emphasized the just cause and classical virtue of their leading characters. In keeping with the New Republic's fetish for classicism and its suspicion of organized religion, anti-slavery writers of this revolutionary generation eschewed the imagery of Christian martyrdom and instead framed slave suicide as the last act of an Aristotelian hero, the nobility of spirit uh, of the wronged black man offering the most affecting testimony to slavery's disgrace. For instance, in 1792, no less than 10 newspapers, 10 different newspapers, brought their readers the final moments of Fidlau, an African king, quote, in whose soul, although uncultivated by science, humanity and every social virtue flourished, unquote. Defeated in battle by a rival leader uh, in league with American slave traders, Fidlau sees that all is lost and thrusts a dagger into his breast rather than endure the indignity of capture and enslavement. Now, when we add Quashie's often repeated story 
to this catalog of distressed righteousness, the sheer repetitiveness of claims that slaves commit suicide to protect their dignity and protest their treatment becomes unmistakable in this revolutionary generation. This is no coincidence. As activists like Swift, Edwards, and Patton knew all too well, early national political discourse was full of insidious assumptions about who deserved freedom and who did not. Revolutionary era claims that the colonists had fought bravely to resist perhaps literal enslavement by the British, and I'm British by the way, had bequeathed the new nation a powerful language to normalize the perpetuation of race slavery. Spread by school books, reading manuals, and hagiographical sketches of patriots like George Washington, the understanding that liberty rests on principled resistance to tyranny achieved common currency after the end of the war. Patrick Henry's cry of liberty or death captured the essence of this mythological view of the revolution. Yet this liberal Republican view of the nation's founding also seemed to implicitly validate uh, planters and slave owners' arguments that their black slaves had consented to their own exploitation by failing to fight to their deaths to resist it. And thus, they deserve no better than continued enslavement. This view was so widely held among the reading populace that early national anti-slavery activists never challenged its logic. Instead, they strove to construct stories in which bondsmen, rarely bondswomen, proved their worth by playing by Patrick Henry's rules, promulgating a vision of a black man willing to sacrifice his life to preserve his dignity and manifest his virtue, each reprinting of Quashie's fatal struggle for mastery, reminded white readers that some exceptional slaves did in fact deserve their freedom and had demonstrated that by being willing to die for it. However, I want to be careful not to overstate the ambition of these early revolutionary era anti-slavery activists. To be sure, the notion that a slave's suicide could mark him out post-mortem as a person of elevated moral stature did mark a bold step forward in the way the urban reading public confronted the black subject after the revolution. Yet almost to a man, and if any female uh, anti-slavery activists contributed to this um, pamphlet literature, they did so anonymously. Almost to a man, these early national advocates refused to contemplate anything more radical than gradual abolition. Condemning the revolutionary bloodshed going on in Haiti at the time uh, and Gabriel's recent slave rebellion in Virginia, most of these revolutionary era activists stopped far short of suggesting that bondsmen imitate en masse the fatal protests that men like Quashi enacted in poetry and in prose. Quote, the moment you act improperly, you can see it here, the moment you act improperly and rebel against the authority of those whom you should serve and whom you are bound to obey, that moment will your friends up in the north forsake you and you, southern slave, will ever remain as you are now, warned the author of this illustrated description of a Philadelphia slave's recent suicide. I hope you can see um, here. Uh, this is a black family, uh, husband and father, um, mother and wife, and a child. They're being transported uh, into Car Caribbean slavery, um, and uh, they have decided that they will refuse to go back. Uh, one morning while their guards, this is in Philadelphia, uh, are distracted, uh, the wife and child make a run for it and succeed in escaping um, from the carriage which will take them to the boat which will take them back to plantation slavery. Uh, the father and husband uh, is not so lucky, his name is Romain, uh, and so instead uh, pulls a dagger across his throat and dies in the middle of a Philadelphia street rather than, rather than submit uh, to Caribbean slavery. Now, as many of, many of you may know, um, anti-slavery activism fell into something of a lull after the congressional ban on the importation of slaves took effect on the first day of 1808. Gradual abolition legislation was by now on the books in every state north of the Ohio River and the Mason-Dixon line, and the horrors of the Middle Passage had been legislated out of legal existence. However, it took a while for anti-slavery activists to realize the limits of what they'd achieved in recent years. Because it was confined wholly within the southern states, the rapid escalation of the domestic slave trade 
after 1808 was not immediately apparent to northern observers. Arriving in Washington, D.C. in 1816 in hopes of, of observing Congress in session, one Philadelphia physician literally stopped in his tracks when he caught sight of a coffle of slaves bound together in pairs by ropes and chains trudging across Capitol Hill, very close to where we're standing right now. As Dr. Jesse Torrey discovered by questioning the slaves and the drivers of this miserable convoy, these Maryland slaves had been parted from their families and were now being in the process of being sold to new masters, not in Maryland, but down in Georgia. This is the domestic slave trade. Reasoning that his fellow Philadelphians and northerners further afield probably shared his own ignorance of the scale and perversity of what he now discovered was a vast and unregulated domestic trade in slaves, uh, Dr. Jesse Torrey rushed into print. Over 62 pages, Jesse Torrey's Portraiture of Domestic Slavery in the United States, published in 1817, declared a new front in the war on American slavery. To condemn the illegal kidnappings and legal breakups of families that were, to his mind, the twin hallmarks of this new domestic middle passage, Jesse Torrey eschewed, um, gave up the more literary and sometimes even poetic forms that many anti-slavery predecessors had favored, and instead, and I see this as a shift, stocked his pages with a series of meticulously sourced descriptions of shocking debasement. So abandoning literary forms, gussing it up in fancy words uh, and poetic styles, now it's just the facts man, okay? Now, in addition to evidence of kidnappings, beatings, and murders committed by buyers, traders, drivers, and their accomplices, a plurality of the dozen or so atrocities documented with loyally precision in Torrey's catalogue of horrors describe how members of slave families killed themselves after being separated from their loved ones and sold south to the new cotton kingdom, Georgia, uh, and even the Gulf states like Mississippi, uh, Alabama, and so on. The details of one woman's attempted suicide was particularly affecting. Tipped off by a lodger at his Washington boarding house, Jesse Torrey had learned that a black woman in another coffle of slaves destined for Georgia had jumped out of the third floor window of a brick tavern on F Street. The fall had broken her back and both of her arms, leaving her close to death. Soon Dr. Jesse Torrey was by her, by her bedside, by her deathbed, I guess, offering his services first as a doctor, but then as her amanuensis. I inquired of her whether she was asleep when she sprang from the window. She replied, no, no more than I am now. Asking her what was the cause of her doing such a frantic act as that, she replied, they brought me away with two of my children and wouldn't let me see my husband. They didn't sell my husband and I didn't want to go. I was so confused and distracted that I didn't know hardly what I was about, but I didn't want to go and I jumped out of the window. This pitiful tale of a wife snatched from her husband only to be driven to distraction and self-harm formed the crux of Jesse Torrey's indictment of the new domestic slave trade. In a marked shift from revolutionary era activists' understanding of suicide as the prerogative of men of exceptional character, the doctor instead places a wife and mother's desperate last act front and center. He, made no, he makes no claims as to this poor woman's virtue, nor does he fate her as a champion of liberty. On the contrary, Jesse Torrey seems to suggest in 1817 that any feeling person in the same position would have done the same. Intended as a clarion call, a call to arms, Jesse Torrey's pamphlet was widely ignored. The pamphlet's very limp sales, no more than 150 copies, reflect most Northerners' lack of appetite for renewing the campaign against slavery in the aftermath of the costly and highly divisive War of 1812. However, although it was roundly snubbed by the general reading public, Torrey's little pamphlet did in fact find its way into the hands of at least three young readers who seem to have studied its contents with care. In later life, Benjamin Lundy, William Lloyd Garrison, and Lydia Marie Child, and I hope you've heard of at least one of those uh, folks, each wrote admiringly of Jesse Torrey's pioneering effort to document the sufferings caused by the internal domestic slave trade. 
Benjamin Lundy, in particular, seems to have studied the Doctor's grisly little catalogue very closely. There are powerful resonances between the genius of universal emancipation, the anti-slavery paper that Lundy founded in 1821, and the pamphlet he once applauded for its unflinching description of the cruelties and misery produced by the internal American slave trade. In fact, one of the signature features of Benjamin Lundy's eclectic newspaper was a graphically delineated special section known as the Blacklist that included many accounts of slaves driven to suicide after being torn from their families and sold south. A Blacklist note for August 1821 gives you a flavor for most similar entries. Here's uh, Lundy's piece. A few days ago, a Negro woman near Snow Hill in this state, on being informed that she was sold, first cut the throat of her child and then her own, by which both of them immediately died. Is there no blame to be attached to the murderous conduct of the villain who can thus with impunity drive the victims of rapacious power to the commission of such a horrid deed. Methinks I now see the creature smiling with the most perfect indifference at a relation of the fatal transaction, apparently no further concerned about it than what the idea of his loss in property suggests. Oh, my country, truly dost thou nurse within thy bosom a scorpion, which it is to be feared will yet sting thee to death. Now, whether the, th the scene was like this one, a Maryland plantation, or a Bladensburg jail, or a steamer bound for Natchez, Mississippi, or a whipping post in New Orleans, the portrayals of slave self-destruction that peppered Benjamin Lundy's blacklist throughout the 1820s and 1830s marked a striking departure from that first revolutionary generation of um, anti-slavery writing that I discussed uh, a few moments ago. Following Jesse Torrey's example, Benjamin Lundy largely rejects the impulse to frame these deaths as freely chosen acts that betoken exceptional character. Instead, he goes in the opposite direction, the same direction that, that uh, Jesse Torrey went in, muting black agency by absolving distressed mothers from responsibility or guilt for their actions, and instead ascribing their suicides to the overwrought grief inevitably produced by the breakup of families. In Lundy's reckoning, the blame for each senseless loss of life was shared between kidnappers, traders, and owners, and the slave system itself. By the time William Lloyd Garrison published the first issue of The Liberator in January 1831, the blacklist had become an irregular feature of Benjamin Lundy's paper, The Genius of Universal Emancipation. Now, although Lundy's paper never achieved a mass circulation. It thus served as an important model for some of the motifs central to the far broader moral suasion campaign that William Lloyd Garrison came to spearhead in the 1830s. In fact, Garrison himself got his start as an abolitionist journalist writing copy for the genius's blacklist uh, when Benjamin Lundy brought the paper to Baltimore in the late 1820s. There's a strong link there between Lundy and Garrison. Now, Garrison did not stay in, Be in Benjamin Lundy's shadow for long. In 1833, and some of you may be familiar with this chronology, uh, Garrison partners with the Manhattan silk importer Arthur Tappan to found the American Anti-Slavery Society, the first abolition society dedicated to the cause of immediate and unmitigated emancipation for all American slaves, a very radical proposition for the time. To rebut pro-slavery, um, excuse me, to rebut pro-slavery depictions of happy and well-cared-for black laborers, the AAAS pours its resources into doggedly detailing the bitter truth of the slave experience for northern readers who had become detached and insulated from the facts of life in the American South. Reflecting the central yet circumscribed role that black activists played in this uh, um, moral suasion campaign, the evidence of ex-slaves featured prominently across every genre of abolitionist writing during the 1830s. Indeed, the emergence of carefully credentialed ex-slave narratives in this period can be best understood uh, as a contribution to this sort of evidentiary journalism. Here are the facts. Look and be horrified. Whether the witnesses were black or white, the overwhelming theme of this extraordinary flood of ink was the veritable agony of the slave experience 
reflecting lessons learned from Benjamin Lundy and perhaps Jesse Torrey too, uh, William Lloyd Garrison and his disciples perfected a style of writing best described as humanitarian realism. This tactic was carefully chosen to tie the cause at hand to prevailing public sensibilities in the 1830s. This pornography of pain became a primary staple, the primary staple, of moral suasion literature in the 1830s, as writers discovered that the gains made by evangelical faiths in many northern states over the past two decades had brought with them a tender-minded revulsion for bodily violence, especially violence to the bodies of women. Depictions of the instruments of physical cruelty, graphic illustrations of their use, and distressing elaborations of the emotional and spiritual scars borne by suffering black servants came to dominate these accounts in the 1830s. So voyeuristic, fetishistic, and ubiquitous were these descriptions that Southerners quickly complained that abolitionists were exaggerating the extent of slavery's cruelties. But Garrisonians refused to relent, holding firm to the belief that their strategy would turn neutrals into partisans. Governed by that imperative, abolitionists pushed proud Caribbean Catos like Quashi to one side. In their place, authors paraded a procession of suffering slaves, a majority of whom were female. Desperate and distracted wives or mothers, torn from their children or otherwise abused, now took center stage as abolitionists worked hard to feminize the image of the American slave in their writing. Rather than wrestle their owners for mastery as Quashi had done, these wounded women knelt in submission, beckoning good Christian readers to rush in from the north and rescue them. Out went encomiums about black virtue, in came language that stripped enslaved people, arguably, of their dignity in order to flatter evangelical self-image as these afflicted men and women's last best hope. Depictions of women driven to suicide loom predictably large in this pageant of humiliated humanity. In fact, so many of these harrowed subjects surrendered to heaven that the image of a female slave lying dead by her own hand became one of the preeminent icons of Garrisonian anti-slavery writing in the 1830s. This iconic status derived in great measure from the fact that three of the most generic scenes in abolitionist print culture encompassed the possibility of the subject's suicide. Whenever white activists or black ex-slave authors described black women and men subjected to unwarranted beatings, or sold away from their loved ones, or cornered or captured having tried to flee, the outcome, in this print culture at least, was often self-inflicted death. Now you can probably imagine what descriptions of suicides following merciless beatings or final forced separations from families look like. In the interest of time today, I'm going to forego the opportunity to parade um, the, that evidence in front of you today. Instead, I'm going to move from, I'm going to move past the first two uh, generic scenes to the third of these pitiful set pieces and briefly examine how Garrisonians tried to wring pathos from the suicides of thwarted runaways. Here's Boston minister and anti-slavery almanac editor Nathan Nathaniel Southard transcribing a news item that had first appeared in two southern papers. The Negro woman, Lucy, confined in our jail here in the South as a runaway, put an end to her existence on the 28th of last month by hanging herself. Her master came to this place the day on which it occurred, and going to the jail was recognized by the woman as her master. He had left the jail but a short time when it was discovered that the woman had destroyed herself. We have never known, the editors of these southern newspapers write, we have never known an instance where so much firmness was exhibited by any person as was by this Negro. The place from which she suspended herself was not high enough to prevent her feet from touching the floor, and it was only by drawing her legs up and remaining in that position that she succeeded in her determined purpose. So while these southern papers emphasized Lucy's firmness and cast her hanging as a determined challenge to those entitled to enslave and imprison her, Nathan Nathaniel Southard 
led readers of his 1838 anti-slavery pamphlet uh, in the opposite direction. In a coda that dramatically reoriented responsibility for her suicide away from firmness and determination, Southard lamented that, quote, Lucy was, in effect, murdered by slavery. She cannot now describe to us the horrors from which she tried to escape, nor speak of the apprehension and despair which impelled her thus to seek the King of Terrors as a shelter from American uh, slavery. In Southard's hands, he's like glossing the previous account from the Southern papers, in Southard's skilled hands, of course, there is no need for Lucy to speak. In Southard's hands, the desperate actions that she'd been impelled to spoke volumes. In Southard's account, Lucy had had no choice. Now, the willfulness of Southard's interpretation of the meaning of this slave's suicide was no aberration. Throughout the 1830s, abolitionist presses turned out account after account of the last moments of failed fugitives, framing almost every self-destructive act as inevitable capitulation to their master's intractable hold over them. They stripped runaways of their courage and turned proud souls into submissive ciphers whose plights pleaded for humanitarian intervention from northern readers of these pamphlets. Even male slaves, a group that revolutionary era activists had worked hard to associate with honor and with virtue, were brought low by this condescendingly but, strategic, but strategically calculated treatment in the 1830s abolitionist press. Among the many frustrated fugitives eulogized in Garrisonian outreach literature in this period, none were more pathetically rendered than Paul, a Congolese man found hiding in a Carolina swamp, having fled his master. According to Charles Ball, and these names sound similar, Paul and Charles Ball, according to Charles Ball, the author of a popular ex-slave narrative, first published in 1836, the man he discovered in the swamp that day was walking wounded. Paul's back was seamed and ridged with scars. Captured and transported to the Americas five years previously, Paul had been forced to leave his aged mother and his wife and his four children in Africa. Ever since, he'd been at the mercy of a drunk and violent owner in Carolina. The master had formed a particular dislike for Paul, forcing Paul to flee to the woods, where Paul had lived on the meager meat of frogs and tortoises for more than three weeks now, afraid to move much or to search for other food in daylight in case someone heard the bells from the iron collar in which his master had encased him for punishment for previous escapes. Paul's thoughts had long, had long ago turned to suicide. And Charles Ball reported to readers of his 1836 autobiography that on their first meeting, Paul, quote, had reasoned with me, does it say that on the screen? No, it doesn't. Um, that on their first meeting, Paul had reasoned with me upon the propriety of destroying a life which was doomed to continual distress. That's the end of the quote. Charles Ball did all he could to ease this man's burdens. He lit a fire, he helped Paul to food, and he implored him to have courage. But when Charles Ball returned uh, a week later uh, with food and supplies, the ravens and the buzzards were circling ominously in this part of the swamp, and Charles Ball soon discovered why. Stories like Paul's saturated abolitionist outputs um, throughout the 1830s intended to appall and to affront readers' delicate sensibilities while simultaneously playing upon Christian sympathy for suffering servants. The endless recycling of so many reports of slaves compelled to suicide by the crushing weight of their peculiar burdens defined the Garrisonian moral suasion campaign at the moment that it achieved a national profile. To do so, abolitionists demonstrated extraordinary message discipline. They distanced themselves from revolutionary era associations between self-destruction and principled resistance to tyranny, and offered instead a remarkably consistent vision of subaltern suicide as the inexorable product of a culture of oppression, what Emile Durkheim later termed fatalistic suicide. Regardless of the specifics of setting or the peculiar 
provo uh, or the particular provocations that actually drove each black person towards their seemingly inevitable self-destruction. Activists repeated the same rationale over and over again. Surely, Charles Bohr, one of these activists, said, surely, if anything can justify a man in taking his life into his own hands and terminating his existence, no one can attach blame to the slaves on many of the cotton plantations of the South when they cut short their breath and the agonies of the present being by a single stroke. What is life worth amidst hunger, nakedness, and excessive toil under the continually uplifted lash? Slavery, Ball argues here, was a special case. And when men and women ensnared in it take their own lives, they should be exempt from the moral and religious reprobation that they would meet with had they been free. When he had been sold south many years earlier, Ball himself had often thought of hanging himself, a fact he now believed said more about his circumstances than about his moral character. Such an act, this is a quote, such an act done by a man in my situation, Ball thought looking back, could not be a violation of the precepts of religion nor of the laws of God. It's slavery that makes you do this. It's slavery. Now, some of you may know what happened next in the chronology I'm laying out here. After the financial crash of 1837, uh, wiped out most of most abolition society's assets, operations in American abolition came to a temporary halt. The pause actually paralyzed the American anti-slavery movement, giving rise to a lot of second guessing within the leadership of various uh, abolition societies as to whether their vast investment in moral suasion was actually paying off. In 1840, after three years of increasingly angry recrimination within the societies, the AASS actually split in two. A majority of its leaders, including Arthur Tappan and James Burney, abandoned the print campaign that had defined organized abolition for the better part of a decade and turned instead to political action in the shape of the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society and later the Liberty Party, a third party effort. A minority of perfectionists like William Lloyd Garrison himself remained behind to continue their program of moral education, refusing to engage with a political system they regarded as constitutionally pro-slavery and thus fundamentally corrupt. In one sense, the split of 1840 had very little effect on the function of black suicide and anti-slavery writing afterwards. Whether allied with the remnant of the AASS under Garrison or operating independently of it, Activists who were still committed to moral suasion resumed their work in earnest after the split. The only marked change was the appearance of novels that attempted to fictionalize the most affecting aspects of documentary testimony. Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852, which found examples for many of the atrocities it described in Theodore Dwight Welt's documentary history, American Slavery as it is, epitomizes the way slave suicide were rendered in this outpouring of literary abolitionism. Some of you may recognize this image. In a dramatic set piece aboard a steamer bound for New Orleans, the slave trader Haley uh, sells a black infant to a fellow white passenger. As Uncle Tom looks on, the child's distraught mother hurls herself from the deck, drowning in the swirling waters of the Mississippi below. The poor, bleeding heart was still at last, Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author, says by way of benediction. Similar episodes, likewise calibrated to, the appeal, to appeal to the maternal instincts of female readers, popped up in many other abolitionist books, plays, newspapers, and pamphlets between 1840 and the eve of the Civil War. However, when we examine the full spectrum of portrayals of slave suicide emanating from abolitionist presses after the split, meaning in the 1840s and 1850s. It is clear that this Stovian brand of humanitarian realism did not reign unopposed. On the contrary, a dramatic reversal in the way that these last acts were understood and represented in the public sphere was already underway in the early 1840s, a shift indicative of the emergence of an important new force in American anti-slavery activity. The moment of the schism in 1840 had coincided, broadly speaking, 
with the arrival in the North of several talented and vocal fugitives like Frederick Douglass and William Wells Brown, as well as the political maturity of several free-born black activists like Henry Highland Garnett, Joshua Bowen Smith, and Martin Delaney. This small coterie of black men perceived that the advance of pro-slavery forces in recent years had left Garrisonians with little to show for their dedication. So these iconoclasts struck out in their own direction, turning their backs on the fight for the hearts and minds of white northern readers, the fight that Garrison was still committed to. Heartened by rising numbers of fugitives arriving in cities like Boston and two successful shipboard slave revolts, including um, the, um, um, the Creole in 1841 and the Armistad, famously, in 1839, these black um, activists broke with the national movement's age-old commitment to pacifism and one, one by one began opening, open, and one by one began opening, I can't say the word, openly, openly, began openly encouraging bondsmen to seize their freedom or to die in the attempt. Henry Highland Garnett, a fugitive turned preacher who had settled in Troy, New York, justified this radical new message emanating from uh, black activists in a pamphlet addressed to the slaves of the United States of America in August 1843. He says, neither God nor angels or just men command you to suffer for a single moment. Therefore, it is your solemn and imperative duty to use every means, both moral, intellectual, and physical, that promises success. If a band of heathen men should attempt to enslave a race of Christians and to place their children under the influence of some false religion, surely heaven would frown upon the men who would not resist such aggression, even to death. Reaching back to the rhetoric uh, long used to justify planters' exploitation of black life and labor, this small band of militants led by Garnet turned Patrick Henry into the hero of their own revolution. Liberty or death, oh, what a sentence was that, Henry Garnet cried. He went on, brethren, arise, arise, strike for your lives and liberties. Now is the day and the hour. Let every slave throughout the land do this, and the days of slavery are numbered, my friends. You cannot be more oppressed than you have been. You cannot suffer greater cruelties than you have already. Look at this last line. Rather die free men than live to be slaves. Now Garnet here did not differentiate between slaves who took their own lives or those who, uh, excuse me, or those killed while trying to flee the plantation or burn the plantation to the ground. What kind of resistance you had better make, you must decide by the circumstances that surround you. Garnet advised. To Garnet, the distinctions between the various forms of resistance uh, were uh, um, contextual and nothing more. Frederick Douglass actually agreed. When his first autobiography appeared in 1845, it redefined the rules for ex-slave writing, draining the genre of the pathos the authors like Charles Ball had cultivated throughout the Garrisonian era of the 1830s. Instead, Frederick Douglass instills a new breed of masculine heroics that places the slave's challenge to the master's authority at the heart of an egocentric narrative. Douglass's various autobiographies, he wrote three, are thus rife with scenes in which the author and other male slaves put their lives on the line to protest their subjection. We did more than Patrick Henry when he resolved upon liberty or death. Frederick Douglass wrote as he described an early attempt to flee his owner's estate. With us, it was a doubtful liberty at most, and almost certain death if we failed. For my part, I should prefer death to hopeless bondage. And he larded his account of his own fight with Covey, a display of machismo unthinkable in ex-slave writing a decade earlier, with similar bravado and signaled his obvious approval when a fellow rebel slave committed an indirect form of suicide rather than be recaptured. Facing a lashing from an overseer for some prior infraction, this rebel slave, Denby, had fled to the safety of a creek and stood there shoulder deep, refusing to come out. Mr. Gore told him that he would give him three calls and that if he did not come out at the third call, he would shoot him. The first call was given, 
Denby made no response, but stood his ground. The second and third calls were given with the same result. Mr. Gore then, without consultation or deliberation with anyone, not even giving Denby an additional call, raised his musket to his face, taking aim at his standing victim, and in, in, in an instant, poor Denby was no more. His mangled body sank out of sight, and blood and brains marked the water where he had stood. Standing his ground, even as his life was threatened, Denby, like Frederick Douglass, seems to prefer death to remaining a slave. In the wake of the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law on the 18th of September, 1850, more and more black leaders began to speak of suicide as a robust defense against the tyranny of the slave power. At an emergency meeting in Boston's Belknap Church, two weeks later, October 5th, 1850, Joshua Bowen Smith, a freeborn black member of the city's new Committee of Vigilance, told the anxious ex-slaves gathered in Boston that if he was ever in their situation and a slave catcher came calling, that he would not be taken alive. After quoting Patrick Henry, Joshua Bowen Smith advised every man present to arm himself with a revolver and be prepared to defend his liberty by dying for it. Many likely did as Joshua Bowen Smith instructed. In fact, when Anthony Burns, a quiet 23-year-old Baptist living in Boston, was arrested under the powers of the Fugitive Slave Act in 1854, some city residents fully expected, expected this black man to pull a pistol or draw a knife across his throat rather than be dragged back to slavery. I cry for shame that he will not kill himself, one inconsolable young black woman reportedly wailed as she watched Anthony Burns shuffle resignedly towards the steamer that would, re that would return him to his Virginian master. Oh, why is he not man enough to kill himself? The emerging conviction that black men who killed themselves were striking a blow against slavery was wrapped up in a broader attempt to reconstitute African-American masculinity in antebellum America. By contrast, black leaders rarely voiced enthusiasm for the idea that slave women had the courage and virtue to mount the same revolutionary opposition. In this respect, Clotel, William, well Brown, William Wells Brown's pointed novelistic response to Uncle Tom's Cabin offers a rare counterpoint. Often regarded as the, whoop, that didn't work, did it? Come on, we've been so good. <laughs> so good, ah, oh, I don't know why that worked. Okay, but it does. Um, often regarded as the first novel by an African-American author, Clotel, 1853, climaxes as a female fugitive races to the banks of the Potomac River pursued by slave captures. She's a slave on the run. Bereft of a revolver, but otherwise in lockstep with Joshua Bowen Smith's advice, Clotel leaps from a bridge as the catchers close in and is drowned in the waters below. The final chapter of this novel, titled Death is Freedom, follows her bloated corpse as it is swept downstream and eventually disgorged on the banks of George Washington's Mount Vernon estate. Clotel's body washes up within sight of the revolutionary hero's tomb, leaving readers to consider the juxtaposition. At first, black leaders who made claims that the suicides of enslaved people could echo the patriotic struggles of the nation's founders did so with very little support from white antebellum abolitionists. Only slowly, as pro-slavery interest in Congress achieved a string of legislative victories, did one white abolitionist after another begin to nod slowly in agreement. Ironically, the most famous pacifist in America was in the vanguard. Stung by criticism that his long-standing objection to violence was hamstringing a proper response to anti-abolitionist riots and lynchings, William Lloyd Garrison briefly laid down his principles in the chaotic years after the split of 1840 and open the pages of his Liberator newspaper to pieces that actually valorized violent black martyrdom. Just three months after Henry Highland Garnett's uh, August 1843 address to the nation's slaves, the Liberator featured a story that distilled this new understanding of the meaning of slave suicide down to its essence. Liberty or death ran the headline, accompanied by a story of a black mechanic from Georgia who had been promised manumission on the death of his owner, only to be sold south by a cheating executor. Snatched from the cusp of freedom, George, the name of the slave, 
had been hastily bundled onto a steamship by his new owner. But as dawn broke the next day, George was nowhere to be found, and the ship's grindstone was missing. They found both at the bottom of the river. Death before slavery, George had tasted liberty, the last line of the report in The Liberator read. Now, The Liberator and its sister paper, The Emancipator, kept up a steady stream of simile-styled stories throughout the 1840s. These items typically struck indignant notes, uh, demanding that readers interpret each Samson-like suicide as a deliberate rebuttal uh, to what a column in The Emancipator called the assertion so often made by apologists for slavery that the slaves are very happy in bondage and like it better than freedom. By the time Garrison ended the Liberator's brief flirtation with righteous violence in 1851, the cause had taken on a life of its own. The Compromise of 1850 and the Passage, passage of the Fugitive Slave Act uh, and the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854 each marked gigantic victories for pro-slavery interests in Congress. In the face of that onslaught, several prominent members of the anti-slavery Liberty Party actually endorsed militant action as a last resort, turning Patrick Henry's revolutionary rhetoric into a plan of action. Men like Gerrit Smith proposed smuggling pistols and pocket compasses into Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia in hopes of encouraging their black brothers to escape to safety in the North, rise up in armed revolt, or die in the attempt. I'm just going to skip through this next slide in the interest of time. I'm almost finished. All right, no, I'll keep this image up. Okay, let me end quickly. By the eve of the Civil War, militant abolitionists, this third wave I've been describing, black and white, militant abolitionists had dug in everywhere. John Brown's repeated attempts to spark slave revolts across the South after 1855 were simply the most extreme manifestations of the growing belief that blood sacrifice was a righteous and purifying right. In fact, the note that this leathery extremist John Brown passed to a jailer uh, moments prior to his own martyrdom in Virginia in 1859 promised that more black blood, the blood of millions, would have to be spilt before the crimes of this guilty land could be purged away. Now, it's become easy over the years to dismiss John Brown's fanatical exploits as the product of his own sui generis conceptions of idealism and self-sacrifice. Yet, as I've tried to argue today, John Brown's ideas about the role of righteous resistance to race slavery had their roots, excuse me, had their roots in a decades-long debate about who had the power to obliterate the country's most entrenched institution. Ironically, given their reputation for immediatist radicalism, Garrisonian campaigners of the 1830s offered the most conservative vision of black agency in the fight against slavery. For the best part of a decade, these Garrisonians had flooded the public sphere with language and images that validated white evangelical readers' heroic instincts while simultaneously dismissing, the, uh, dismissing slave suicides as fatalistic capitulations and transferring responsibility for each death to the peculiar institution or its despicable white agents. It fell to men like Henry Highland Garnet, Gerrit Smith, and Frederick Douglass to challenge the implicit ra racism of Garrisonian rhetoric. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. If anyone has any, uh, any questions as a result of that rather lengthy uh, diatribe, I'd be very happy to struggle my way to an answer in front of you. Uh, you're the first hand I saw. Well, what was the general feeling about suicide in the culture just generally in, in the 18, early 1800s? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, <coughs> no one is really in favor of suicide. At this point uh, in American history, I would argue that today we're not too far, actually, in, in the way that the general public feels about uh, suicide when asked about it in polls. Uh, most early Americans uh, at the end of the 18th century and the start of the 19th century would have said that suicide is wrong, and it's wrong for three reasons. Uh, it's wrong because it is a crime against God. Uh, even by the end of the 18th century, um, there's a lot of people still very, very serious about the religious beliefs, of course. In fact, in the early 19th century, the Second Great Awakening makes a lot more people very serious 
about a religious beliefs. That uh, suicide is a crime against God. It is a violation of what is it? The sixth commandment: Thou shalt not kill. Someone could nod or shake their head if I got the wrong number, but I think it's the sixth commandment. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a, it's a, so it's a, it's a violation of God's will, a usurpation of His power. Uh, it's a religious huge no-no. Uh, number two: uh, r- Suicide is unnatural. Uh, that every being, every human being, every being, period, has a natural instinct to preserve its own life. Uh, we have a survival instinct, which to suppress is simply unnatural. And number three, that suicide is a crime not just against God and against nature, but a crime against society. That by taking my life, I affect your life. Uh, if, uh, if we are married, you know, my, my suicide affects you and, and the, rest of, the rest of our family. Um, uh, we are in a society together. We signed. We signed. We signed a social contract. We're all in a republican system of government where we are all voters. We are all the constituent organs uh, of a political system. If I take my own life, that is a huge vote of political no confidence in the entire United States system. Um, so suicide remains a deeply problematic. And one of the things I'm trying to argue in this paper is that one of the curious things uh, that happens uh, in the course of the anti-slavery campaign is that these activists try to carve out a set of circumstances, very circumscribed, in which suicide is OK. Uh, but that, that just reminds us that in every other circumstance, suicide is not OK at, at all. Uh, that Charles Ball has the quote, right? Like, slavery uh, is, is so uh, abominable that it's a special case. So that's the general context. Thank you for the question. Were there more on the hands? Yes, ma'am. Uh, about this time, Weren't they had a, a lot of people that were indentured servants mm-hmm. or either Irish sailors who were prone on to go on these ships and everything? Uh, the Native Americans were, these are all forms of slavery. And what about the, the, the debtor's prison? Mm-hmm. Not a kind of oppression of slavery? Uh, the other one is women that were oppressed that evening. They couldn't marry well, they come from an agrarian society, they were always worked. Thing was just, it's like, it's like you didn't put yourself into the situation, but because you're poor, you didn't have alternatives. So it's still a part of slavery. So what I hear you asking me is, well, how special are these circumstances? Is slavery really that special? Aren't there other forms of tyranny and oppression which are equally uh, dramatic and extreme? Uh, and there's two ways. There's a couple ways to answer this question. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to say is, is that why the people look the other way? Because uh, all around them is the pressure. Well, these anti-slavery activists did want to distinguish slavery as being much worse, much different to a bad marriage, much different to being an apprentice to your master who doesn't give you the three meals you promised, doesn't let you go, go out at night. Uh, if you're a servant, you're usually a servant for a set number of years. You know that your time as a servant will end. Maybe it's two years from now, maybe it's eight years from now, but you know because you have a signed contract when you're going to stop being a servant. And you do see divorce laws uh, start to become slightly more flexible and permissive in this period. So women trapped in violent marriages had slightly more tools by the end of this period to get out of them than they did at the start. But yes, of course, there is a comparison to be made. And many of the folks I'm talking about who are committed to fighting slavery are often also committed to uh, improving the, um, the status of Native Americans uh, in American political culture, um, working to get... Um, uh, servants, better conditions, were working to uh, help prostitutes get back on their feet and get out of the, the gutter, uh, and to help um, uh, liberalize divorce laws to make uh, violent marriages easier to get out of. So there are some strong parallels here. And anti-slavery activists were torn between their obvious sympathy for all people who were the victims of oppression and tyranny, no matter what their color or gender, and their assertion that slavery is the worst of the worst. And it's slavery we have to do something about because it's the most egregious, the most destructive, the most horrible institution that we have. Um, but even if you look at marriage, for instance, there were plenty of people advocating for uh, looser divorce laws uh, who made the claim um, that uh, violent marriages uh, are as oppressive as slavery. Violent marriages are as likely to lead to suicide, in particular, as slavery uh, is. And they would draw those parallels, the exact parallels, uh, you're making. So it was, a, it was a really important question at the time. How similar or different uh, are various oppressive institutions? Yes, sir. Um, sort of continue along that vein. Um, you saw some, 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 some reports in the news of women in 
other parts of the world engaging in, say, self-immolation in response to their particular um, situation in society. I mean, you still hear about it in India, for example, occasionally women just choosing to immolate themselves as a reaction to their the situation in society. So it seems like it's not solely a thing of the past. Tra tragically not. And, and at the end of the 18th century and the start of the 19th century, when this paper is focused, Americans were learning more than they'd ever learned before about, for instance, native cultures in India, in, in South Asia. So you were starting to see American newspapers filled with reports about how strange the natives of South Asia are. And widow burning, the idea that uh, if, a, if, a, if a husband dies, the wife has to sacrifice her life so she can be with her husband immediately in the afterlife and serve him there, uh, were all over American newspapers. And Americans were freaked the hell out um, that this uh, was going on and started to draw power, look, looked around to see if America was like that or not. And some you know, uh, activists would, would started to draw comparisons that said, yes, American marriage is as brutal and demanding as these Indian marriages that end in uh, suicide. And others said, hold on a minute, we're different um, from them. This debate about um, you know, whether uh, other cultures are fundamentally different or fundamentally part of a you know, sort of human family of, of culture uh, was, was, was uh, reigning uh, at the time. And uh, one obvious way in which reports of widow burning wound up in the American press was people who were very critical of evangelical religion, very critical of evangelical camp meetings, ev evangelical revival meetings, uh, would uh, draw comparisons between the frenzy and hysteria of a widow burning ceremony in South Asia and the frenzy and hysteria and unchecked emotional enthusiasm of Methodist camp meeting. I'm not sure the parallel is a strong one, uh, but they were saying, look, you should hate Methodist camp meetings, you should watch out for them, they're dangerous, they're full of hysteria and disappointment. Uh, in the same way, you're terrified by these, uh, these widow burnings. Uh, yes? I have a really quick question. I heard you uh, mention in response to her question that at that time um, suicide was kind of viewed as a crime against God and nature and so forth. But I don't know if this is a 20th century thing or not, but like sometimes this suicide is thought of as weak. And I was wondering, in, when you were doing your research, have you, did you ever run across the opposite argument? Like, de-slave method, I believe this, of course. But, you know, we're doing this, this was out of weakness of their character, yes. out of weakness of their... Yes. That's a great right. question. And you know, I, I sort of hinted at this in my paper, but did not go into it at all. Right, this is a pro-slavery argument made by slave owners that how do we explain all these suicides on our plantation? Well, it's not my fault, right? And this is not, a, um, this is not my slave making a principled strike for liberty because well, he has nothing to complain about. I treat him so well. This is a sign of his moral uh, weakness, his natural laziness, or his or her uh, natural laziness. But he is just weak-minded, and he's lucky to be here in the first place. I treat him so, so nicely. So you see that argument made. You also see it made in other contexts. For instance, um, at the end of the 18th century, a lot of um, teenagers and young adults are discovering novels for the first time. Novels were a pretty new genre at the end of the 18th century. And uh, parents are freaked the hell out by the sort of novels their teenage children are reading. Many of these no novels feature suicide. Uh, and parents start complaining in the public press that reading about suicide, if you're a weak-minded teenager, makes you more likely to go out and do it. Um, and, you, you, and this is the origin. It's called the Werther effect, by the way, named after the sorrows of young Werther, a German novel. Um, but you hear exactly the same logic that reading about something makes you more likely to do something if you're weak-minded. Uh, in the current debate about you know, whether listening to rap makes you more likely to use profanity or shoot a police officer, whether playing violent video games makes you more likely to um, kill a prostitute with your car. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so exactly the same arguments resonate today, and I argue that you know they have their sort of origin at the end of the 18th century when print is so is 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 expanding so rapidly that it's such an obvious thing to have an opinion about, to worry about. Uh, previous to that, not enough people uh, could read; newspapers were hard to come by. Bo books weren't very w books were very scarce. So it's the end of the 18th century. The arguments about the power of the press or the power of the media would be a better way to put it start to generate a lot of heat. Uh, and perhaps not much light. Uh, how many more? I've got time for maybe two more. Um, yes, sir, and then yes, here. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you, if you uh, it would be great if you covered, uh, remember the savage god, Carlos Alvarez? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you know that suicide is a, is a uh, um, is that, we used to be a mortal sin in the Catholic Church. It was, a, it, was, it, was a, it was a capital offense under a common law at one point, anyway. And I, um, I'm just trying to think, uh, you know, bikini, the surface. 10 or 20, year, 20 years ago, uh, when the suicide at Jonestown, 
all of a sudden the idea of suicide is something more than just, you know, act of weakness as a statement of some kind. Mm -hmm. I, I was also wondering if you could recall for me who the, who the British general was in India who, when he was faced with the widow burning. Is it Hastings? I got an expert on India. No, no, he, no, he insisted. It was a British, British general. Yeah. And they, you know, taking over uh, the administration of India, and they were saying, we, we have to burn this uh, widow. She's the wife of this prominent man. It's one of our customs, and we've always followed it, and, mm -hmm. and we, we have to do it. And uh, the British general said, uh, well, you're uh, free to follow your religious and traditional customs. Of course, we have a custom, too which would call for hanging you by the neck, you know, if you do that. So you, follow <laughs> you follow your custom and we'll follow ours. Yeah. You know. yeah. I, I'm happy, I, I don't know the answer to the question about who the general was. Um, uh, one brief response to pick up some comments I made earlier on about religious revivals. And I was suge suggesting that um, religious revivals cause controversy, but not, ev not everyone thought they were great. In fact, the people who thought they were least great were the competitors of evangelical religions. Uh, namely the liberal religions which are getting up and running in the 19th century, uh, the Unitarians and particularly the Universalists, later they would merge. Um, in the um, start of the 19th century, Universalists um, want to differentiate themselves from uh, this hysterical emotional Methodism you all seem to be loving out in your camp meetings. Uh, and their, their doctrine um, uh, is, is a very clear-headed one. It says, uh, we are all saved, uh, we're all saved right now, it uh, doesn't matter what you do. Everyone here is going to heaven, no matter what you do. Very compassionate um, and sort of clear-headed uh, thing, which does not require a very emotional conversion experience. It does not require revival meetings at all, because you're already going to heaven. Great. Um, Methodists hit back at that sort of, of theology, saying, well, so you're saying that murderers go to heaven? You're saying that rapists go to heaven? Uh, you're saying that people that commit suicide and mortal sin in uh, many people's minds um, go to heaven? And Universal said, no, 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 you didn't read the small print. The small print was, <laughs> small print was um, that, uh, <laughs> the small print is, eventually, uh, right, um, that you're, uh, if, you, if you're a rapist, if you're, if you're a murderer, uh, then you are going to uh, um, uh, uh, experience a period of judgment and punishment, uh, like a sort of purgatory sort of deal, for 50,000 years uh, after you die. But then you get to heaven. But that 50,000 years is not very good. Uh, so, but uh, uh, that nuance was, uh, uh, it was ha they had very, a, lot, a very difficult time getting that nuance out into the public, uh, public prints. So Methodists spent most of the 1820s, 30s, 40s um, lambasting um, the Universalists as a suicide cult that said, you know, if you're going, going to go to heaven and your life is shit, then cut your, cut your throat now, right? In this caricature of Universalist theology, which doesn't read the small print and ignores it, um, everyone goes to heaven. So if your life is terrible, even for a moment, cut your throat now, and you'll go to heaven. This is the first time you see American um, uh, uh, media uh, the claim that a religion is a suicide cult. It's the Universalists in the 1820s and 30s. So a tangential relation to your original question. You get the final question. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm from a foreign country. Um, so am I. You know, studying foreign history. <laughs> uh, so I'm not really familiar with um, uh, you know, American history, historiography. But I'm just curious about how you would place yourself in the his historiography of African American history, like mm -hmm. you know, I'd like to know you know what kind of arguments has been made in African American history and how that you know you know relate to your current research. Uh, okay, there's a couple of ways to answer that. Um, one would be to say that the more research we do on the international slave trade and on plantation slavery, uh, the more we become aware of just how uh, frequent um, uh, various forms of what I'm going to call resistance. Uh, were to plantation slavery or to being captured and kidnapped. Uh, now, whether you consider self-destruction to be resistance uh, or the product of oppression, I'm going to leave to, to individuals in this room. Uh, but we know of, of tens of thousands um, of um, uh, Africans or African Americans who committed suicide or attempted it. Now, what gloss you put on that, how you interpret that, is one of the questions I deal with in my paper. What I do want to sort of end with in relation to what you're talking about with historiography uh, is something that I hope was... Um, clear from the paper, but perhaps not. And that is the idea that um, what I'm talking about in this paper is how abolitionists, whether they're white or black, um, represented slave suicide and tried to interpret it and then present that interpretation to you all and say, look, uh, slave suicide happens because they're oppressed or um, because they are weak or um, because they are strong, because they are resisting. That those, which is a different question from saying that I, Rick Bell, have the faintest idea about why real living and breathing 
um, black people took their lives. Uh, it's very difficult uh, for historians to say with anything approaching certainty why any individual, black or white, slave or free, uh, who's been dead 200 years, uh, took their own lives. Uh, well, so what I'm interested in is seeing how um, those um, suicides were represented and how motives, motives were attributed to them by these anti-slavery writers to serve a political agenda and also by pro-slavery folks to serve a political agenda like the, the question the lady asked uh, earlier on. Um, the sources don't allow us to say with any certainty why people kill themselves. In fact, you know, t having worked on the subject of suicide for close to 10 years now, uh, I'm increasingly convinced that it's very difficult for us to even know amongst people living and breathing amongst us today why suicide happens in the way it does, how we explain it, uh, what mo is, it always, is there one motive, is there 10, do they work together, do they work separately, is it short-term triggers, long-term causes? Understanding with any, I think, subtlety why people kill themselves is a very, very difficult question. So in some ways, I've taken perhaps the easy option here, looking at representation of motives and how that's used for political uh, purposes. I make no claims um, uh, as to why individuals mentioned in this paper actually killed themselves. I'm interested in showing you uh, what people thought about why they killed themselves, how that changed over time, and what political agendas that might have served. And with that, um, I will stop. Thank you again. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.